he comes across as a, an aw shucks kind of guy. He's um, made a steal. He's been to a lot of tough situations and done wonderful science in those places, and he's still doing that with his students. Um, among other things, I had him write out a list of things so I didn't gargle everything. Um, he did finish his PhD at Duke in 1985, came here right after that. Um, he has become an endowed chair, the Adirondack Chair in Paleoecology and Lake Ecology at Fall Smiths. Um, they felt uh, strongly enough about him that they cobbled together an endowment for that. Um, he was also named the Carnegie Case Science Professor of the Year in New York State in 2013. So he's very much the real deal. Um, there's a long list of other things here. He's published in National Geographic. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But um, I've taken long enough. Let me have Kirk come up and tell us about what happens after global warming. and in education. Uh, I'm sorry. Both science and education. Yes. Both of those things. And they go together very well. And it's important to be able to do both. And Larry is one of the few people that knows how to do them both exceptionally well. And I'm happy to hear from the touring I did today at the Institute that he's still got that reputation among the young folks that had the honor of studying with him. So thanks, Larry, for everything. And you've got a real gem right here. So, uh, as you probably guessed, uh, tonight I'll be talking about climate change, but not in a way that you may have heard before. This is um, not just talking about what's happening today, but it's taking a long view of the future. Um, and I'll ask you to sort of stretch your normal time frames out to kind of understand this, but I think it's important because it helps us to understand what we are facing today and also how important we are today. So really, although the uh, main topic is climate change, there's a subtopic and it's about us and our place in the big picture of history. So I also want to reassure you what the talk is not. It's not uh, <laughs> politics, which a lot of folks think as soon as you think global warming and climate change, it's this and that, but no, it's I'm going to stick to the science. Um, and there really is science, I'm sure a lot of you know that, but uh, just to reassure you in case you were wondering, there's very, very good science behind this, and um, I feel it's, it's uh, you know, politics, it's always politics, but it's, uh, I feel like science is uh, most valuable, of course, when it rises above that. Um, I see really good science kind of the way you would see the Red Cross on a battlefield. When you have uh, opposing views on a topic, science should be able to serve everybody with the best facts, and I feel like uh, that's the mission that uh, we take, and it's a very precious thing we have in our civilization to have science in places like this. So uh, one of my favorite quotes, and I'll come back to it again in the talk, is uh, from Thomas Henry Huxley, who was a scientist in the 1800s, and uh, one of his sayings was, we need to learn what is true so we can do what is right. And I think that's never been more important than it is today. So. Um, to sort of dial out here and get the, the big picture of what I'll be talking about is to try to get a sense of our place in Earth history. Um, if you add up the kinds of effects that humans are having on the Earth now from different branches of science or society, you'll notice people n noticing the mass extinctions going on around the world, invasive species moving, farms and cities covering the planet, pollution and trash from pole to pole and in the deep sea, reshaping of landscapes, greenhouse gas buildups, which will be the main topic of today, and even how the Earth looks from outer space, uh, like a picture there on the shadow inside of the Earth that now glows in the dark for the first time in its history. And this is because of us. And if we go down this litany of woes, of course, it can be very depressing. But the flip side of this is really, I think, important to get at as well. These things are happening because we're powerful and a force of nature. And uh, to realize that we are able to do this unintentionally, I think, is also a key to the empowerment we will have to be able to do things on purpose 
uh, for better goals as well. And that'll be the theme of tonight as well. Um, so I won't go down the big list of how we know it's uh, global warming is real and now we know it's us. The short version is there are only three things that can change the global climate at the pace it's been going on. One is the sun, one is volcanoes, and one is greenhouse gases from us. We've been monitoring all three of those for, for decades in a row. The sun is not doing anything unusual in the recent decades. The volcanoes are not doing anything unusual. Uh, also, we are dwarfing their outputs of carbon dioxide. We release 100 times more than all the volcanoes of the Earth combined. But if you watch the temperature curve go up, uh, which it has been doing since the 1970s, it matches the carbon dioxide curve process of elimination. It's us. Um, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to talk about sea level rise here in North Carolina. <laughs> when I came down. So I won't say anything about that wiggly line there, whether it's tilting up or not on the right. It says Wellington on it. But uh, here's another little extra thing. I mean, it's such an interlocking puzzle with so many pieces in it. Here's one you may not have known of. It might be uh, fun to have in your back pocket if you want to talk to somebody. Um, not only can we measure the carbon dioxide increasing in the atmosphere, and you've probably heard of that from our uh, burning of fossil fuels, but of course the flip side of combustion is that the, the carbon that was in the coal, oil, and gas has to combine with oxygen to go up in the air as a gas. Uh, that means oxygen levels should be declining, and they are. So it's not like you're going to run short of breath or everything, but we can measure the decline in oxygen as the CO2 is going up. So it's a, it's a case closed thing. Um, thought you'd, you'd want to want to know that but um, one of the keys to getting this concept of looking far into the future is of course to make the distinction between the weather and climate you could say well how can you talk about the far future of climate if we don't know what the weather is going to do the next week and of course it's important to remember the terminology weather is different from climate weather is short term what happens here and now climate is longer term over larger areas and maybe one way to think of it is uh, the road you might take to go up into the mountains has ups and downs in it. The ups and downs are the weather. The upward trend of the trip into the mountains is climate. And that's what I'll be talking about. And it may seem surprising that actually climate is easier to predict on average than a lot of weather. Because it's a broad brush thing. And uh, what I'll be talking about is well supported by computer models and theory, but it's also common sense, as I, ho as I hope I'll be able to show you. But the key to this is going to be to think longer term than we normally do. So if uh, you're one of the students in the audience, you know, a long time in the future may be when this talk is over, or, you know, <laughs> when do I get my degree, or something like that, or, or for normal people. But if you've uh, heard about the projections of climate change, you may have heard long-term projections which say, if we continue as we are, then by the end of this century, it will be this warm, or sea level will be this high, or something, and as if that's the end of the world, as if it's a horizon that you can't send your imagination beyond. Uh, I want to go over that ridge with you. We can look farther than 2180, and what we see there is some really important things that help us understand what we're setting in motion now and what our place in this amazing story is. So um, there's a lot of science behind it, but a lot of it's intuitive. So just Having the ability, which we do now, to see an image of the planet we live on, to realize we do live in a, on a planet, and that the atmosphere that we're dumping this carbon emissions from coal, oil, and gas, that we're dumping it into a very thin, thin layer, like paper thin on that globe there, of course then, um, there isn't really that much of an atmosphere to dump into, and it'll, it fills up <laughs> with stuff. But when you see it like this, it's easier to ask the question, not uh, does it just go away downwind? Where does this stuff go when it comes out of our tailpipes and smokestacks? Well, uh, we do know where it goes. People measure it. One of the surprising places, of course, uh, which shouldn't be too surprising, I guess, is uh, one of the places it goes is us. We're connected to the atmosphere by the food chains of the world. When we put carbon dioxide in the air, that's food for plants. They eat the carbon dioxide, they take the carbon atoms, make wood and leaves and fruit. It goes through the food chains through the animals and plants onto your dinner plate and into us. Which means, talking about the atomic self, um, we can calculate uh, based on the um, concentration of fossil emissions in the atmosphere now that one in eight of the carbon atoms in your body right now recently emerged from a tailpipe or a smokestack. 
we're not only producers of air pollution, we're becoming air pollution. That's one of the places it goes. However, most of it is going into the oceans, which makes sense. Gas is dissolved in water. Oxygen dissolves in water. The tough fish breathe, of course. So does CO2. Most of the planet's covered by water. That's where most of it is going. And I just sort of marked the fossil carbons in red, but uh, whatever. It, it dissolves in the water and has some complex chemical reactions that it, that it goes into. So that's where uh, most of it is going to go kind of in the geological short term. But the oceans can only take up so much. There's a limit to how much is going to dissolve in there, and then it just starts coming back out as much as goes in. It reaches an equilibrium. <clears throat> so it's kind of like uh, once the oceans have this feast on the carbon we emit, about a fifth of it, a quarter to a fifth of it, is stranded in the air as leftovers that the ocean just cannot take up at the moment. Um, however, um, it's not there permanently. It's also then able to dissolve into rain, fall to the ground as a little bit of weak carbonic acid, naturally acidic rain slightly, and it reacts with uh, rocks, minerals, soils, and tumbles into streams and groundwater, and then washes into the oceans along with those dissolved minerals. So it's, it's like having an antacid pill after the feast. And uh, so the ocean then is able to take up even more. So first the ocean is going to take up most of it, then a slow reaction with the geology of the Earth. Eventually it's all going to go in there. A lot of it will be in solution. Some of it's going to come out as seashells, coral, natural precipitates of lime and things like that. But um, that's not controversial. It's not even all that surprising, really. You can just follow the atoms, and, and people do that. What's shocking to me and made me want to write the book, The Future, was the time scale of all this stuff. And uh, I'm not going to show a whole lot of graphs, but I want to show you this one and uh, kind of dig into it a little bit. This is the graph that made me want to write the book. This was uh, by a uh, uh, climate researcher David Archer at University of Chicago, but it's well supported by other labs around the world that do similar calculations. It's a map of the future showing uh, two possible scenarios depending on how much fossil fuel we burn in the next century or two. So um, on the bottom here is a time scale. It's in thousands of years from now. So here's the present day. There's 10,000, 20,000, 60, 100,000 years into the future. Mm -hmm. And on this scale is how much carbon, basically heat trapping carbon dioxide, is in the atmosphere. And there are actually two curves on here. I'll show you the small one first. There's a dotted line, which is really faint and kind of hard to see. So if you start here in the present day at the star where we are, a little bit above 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the air. If we switch quickly from fossil fuels to whatever the alternatives are, as quickly as we can, we'll get something like this. The emissions are still going to continue for a while, and we'll get maybe 500, 600 parts per million. Then, as we stop emitting, the amount in the air will start dropping, because the ocean's soaking it up, kind of cleaning it up. But what you might not be able to see too clearly here is it drops quickly, and then tails off. And that's because the ocean can't do anymore. What's happening here with this slow drop, uh, drop down is the slow uptake by the rocks and minerals, which takes about 100,000 years to soak up what we've emitted and what little we may do if we do the moderate case. 100,000 years. It's not a case of decades, even centuries in the future. Even a lot of scientists are not getting this yet. It's not even a few thousand, it's tens of thousands of years what we've already done. And this is a heat trapping gas, also keeping the planet a little warmer. So we'll get into how extreme that is, but what I want to get at is, is the alternative to this. As extreme as this may seem, if we don't switch from fossil fuels as quickly as possible, we'll still switch. We'll just do it later because we ran out you know, in a century or two, whatever it is. But then the stuff will also be in the air when we don't have any more to burn. If we do, this is an approximation of what the concentrations in the air will be if we burn it off, or, or what we can get our hands on. And it looks like a needle you could prick your finger on. It's amazing. It goes up, 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 way above, maybe close to 2,000 parts per million. And this is a heat trapping gas, so that's kind of a temperature curve, too. And then it goes up. And then we ran out, and we stopped, 
So therefore, we're not putting any more in. This is the ocean soaking it up. And then the oceans can't take any more. And this is the slow reactions by the minerals and the rocks. And notice, it doesn't even come all the way down in 100,000 years. If we do this, it's about half a million years to recover. This is all being decided here. Here, in this century, in the next few decades, we're going to decide which of these two things we're going to do, with consequences going hundreds of thousands of years into the future. It's amazing. It's scary. It's stunning. And it's true. You can do this intuitively as well. But there's, there's more to it. I mean, the shape of this, too, is really interesting. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. That turnaround point is going to be really interesting as well. Right now, we're focused on the leading edge of this issue. But the tail end of it is so far in the future, to put this into geological uh, perspective, we know what the natural cycles are that a lot of folks try to blame climate change on now. We know what they are, the, you know, the tilt of the earth and those kinds of things. So we can run those into the future, and we know where they go. So experts do that. I ask some of them, you know, give me the data to show you. OK, the next natural cycle that would trigger an ice age is about 50,000 years from now. So here's the chart. This, is, this line here is insulation in the, the, in the northern, you know, in the Arctic, where the ice sheets form kind of the seed ground, seed bed of ice ages. And it kind of goes up and down. These are tens of thousands of years. About 50,000 years from now, there will be kind of a cool time up there in the north. And uh, it could be that uh, not all the snow melts in the summer. And you could build up ice sheets for thousands of years and eventually have Canada go away. That's what an ice age is. Well, if you remember the time frame we talked about, even in our moderate case, by 50,000 years from now, there will still be enough of our excess fossil carbon, heat trapping carbon, in the air to raise the Earth's temperature just enough to cancel that ice age. We've stopped the next ice age already. We can you know, argue whether that's good or bad. Are there any Canadians in the audience? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, I mean, upstate New York doesn't do too well either. One bit, so, but the point here is the magnitude, the power of what we were able to do inadvertently. The key here is to understand that we have this power, that we have become a geological force of nature. And I think the most important mission we can have is to become aware of that and help the new folks on the earth to see their place in that too. So to kind of get into the hairy nitty gritty of this, what fascinated me was that turnaround time. So I try to think of a kind of a sexy term for it. It's like climate whiplash. Look at this. We're focused on the warming now, right? And that's going to be the story of this century. Well, at some point it's going to turn around. Well, what's that going to be like? We're focused on going up, 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 up like this, warming, warming, and sea levels doing what they do or don't do or whatever. And then you get up there. And all the adaptive stuff, which has, by the way, lasted centuries on this scale, you know, it's instantaneous, but it's a century we're talking, going up here is going to have to flip into reverse to be adaptive. This turnaround time is going to be amazing. And by the time uh, that is reached, there will be whole new ecosystems and cultures that are going to have to adapt to the opposite side of the curve. So we're not just causing disruption by warming the Earth. The higher we push us, the more disruptive the return is going to be, too. It's bigger than what we're acknowledging we're doing. And a lot of it's hard to just grasp the warming part, right? And make ourselves face this, have the courage to face this reality. But uh, it's way bigger than what we're even struggling to face. I think it's important to acknowledge that. So maybe one way to visualize this is, uh, you know, we talk about the de-icing of the Arctic Ocean now. We're seeing that's going to happen, you know. Probably by uh, the end of the century, you can only use that time frame. You'd say, well, it'd be normal to not have a lot of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean in the summer. And, uh, you know, Northwest Passages, uh, Passage is opening up. So that's kind of mind-boggling for us because we're used to having it frozen up there. Now imagine it, it'll be like that for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, long enough for new ecosystems to form up there and cultures to form and become ancient. And then it's going to unravel. Because of what we do now, in 100,000 years, it starts to freeze over. Imagine that, an ancient culture, ancient ecosystems having to deal with the place freezing over again. It won't feel like a recovery to them. 
It'll be climate change caused by people in the distant past. If you could imagine, uh, oh, it's some morning in 10, 000, 100,000 AD, there's a fishing village up there in the uh, Arctic Circle, and uh, people walk down to the shore in the morning to get to their fishing boats and then to the fishery that's been up there for a thousand years. And they come down, and there's this thin rime of ice forming on the shoreline, and the elders say, gosh, I never saw that before in my life. And can you imagine, what if the whole place froze over? No, that couldn't happen. So this is the scale of what we're setting in motion now, especially if we do the extreme case. So now the next question, of course, is, OK, what's this going to be like? And you never know exactly, of course, but um, there are clues from having a long time perspective aimed backwards into the past, which is my specialty and some of you in the room here work with this too. We have examples of what this stuff could be like from the past. It's uh, paleoecology, you know, you can do sediment cores, tree rings, coral borings, ice cores, all these kinds of things. And we've reconstructed, you know, millions of years of climate change. Here's the global temperatures since the dinosaurs died out here from uh, marine cores gradually dropping down from the hot dinosaur times to the ice ages of the last two or three million years. There are two good examples from that curve I want to show you that sort of illustrate these two scenarios of the moderate emissions versus the burn it all scenario. Um, the extreme one was up there. I'll, I'm going to start with that smaller one. This is between the ice ages, which we've had dozens of, there are short-term warmings called interglacials. They last roughly 10,000 years, 10, 20,000 years. The last one ended you know, a little more than 100,000 years ago. It was a little warmer than it is now. A few degrees warmer. Um, and if you look at what the world was like then, you have a rough idea of you know, ecologically anyway, climatically, kind of what it might be like if we do the moderate scenario. We get a little bit warmer. What happened when we had this last interglacial? Well, from the paleo studies around the world, we know that if you went to England, by the white cliffs of Dover, you'd see elephants, hippos, water buffalo. Animals from Africa migrated north. It was warm enough to live in England. Um, it, when they do uh, road repairs in London, they dig up, you know, uh, Piccadilly Circus, whatever, their saber tooth and the elephant bones in there and stuff like that. So we know uh, that happened. Most of the tropics got wetter. And that's what the climate models say should happen. You know, more evaporation from the oceans, so a warmer, more turbulent, moister atmosphere. The Sahara was green, running with rivers, lakes, and had forests and wildlife. And, uh, your Blue Ridge came all the way up to my Adirondacks. <laughs> we have pollen records from there, from the last interglacial. There was, uh, you know, black gum, hickory, oaks, and things up there growing. Just like we say in the climate models. This is not wild-eyed fantasy. This is supported by the past. This actually happened with a similar warming, not caused by us, but a natural warming. This is absolutely reasonable stuff. Um, if you're worried about the ice sheets, uh, we know what happened to those. In that last interglacial, um, places like Greenland did melt a lot, but they didn't melt completely, even after 10,000 or more years. So uh, polar bears survived it. There were enough cold weather habitats that Arctic fauna survived, even though it was a smaller area. We also know when that much uh, ice melted, what it did to sea levels, not here in North Carolina, but everybody else. This is in uh, South Africa. You go down by Durban on the coastline there, you can find uh, oysters, the oyster researchers here, still in growth position from the last interglacial, 20 or 25 feet above sea level at the head of the beach, waiting for the water to come back, maybe. So uh, we know about what this would be like. We also have the example of the extreme case. On that chart I showed you back closer to the time of the dinosaurs. This is way back, not thousands, but millions of years ago about 56 million years ago, 10 million after the death of the dinosaurs, there was a massive runaway greenhouse, not caused by people at all. It happened by itself. We don't know exactly how. Probably related somehow to volcanic activity in the Atlantic Ocean Basin. Something about that, but it was greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, went into the air, trapped extra heat, and made this giant spike that looked a lot like that graph I showed you. It's called the PETM, that's the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, they called it. 
3,000 parts per million carbon dioxide. That's pretty high. Maybe 20 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer on average around the world. You know, these are all estimates, so that's the ballpark, kind of what we're talking about. Um, the poles were de-iced. Uh, we lost all the, the cold habitats on Earth. There were uh, beech tree forests all over Antarctica. That's in, that was Antarctica. There were redwood forests, deciduous redwood forests, circling the Arctic. The uh, Arctic Ocean was ice-free. It was uh, because there was no snow. Everything, all the rain would wash in. It became a warm, brackish pond full of water weeds. It was warm enough for you to swarm in the summer without a chill. And um, there was green, lush forests from pole to pole. It was, uh, if you were a warm, loving animal, it was actually pretty good. Species would have evolved in one area, like in China, and suddenly appear on all the continents. Because they could travel everywhere. But that was only for if you were warm adapted. So again, this can really happen. Um, when you lost all the ice, sea level was 230 feet higher vertically, which is uh, pretty serious. This is where the time perspective is important to be careful with. You don't panic. It's, this is slow stuff. If we, you know, we, we're not sure how far sea level will come up, you know, maybe one, two, three feet, or most likely in the, by, the end, by this century. At that rate, something like this kind of map here of inundating Florida could take, you know, a thousand years. And a picture of the of Florida like this, when you lost all the ice, you know, could take 10,000 years. So that's not to belittle the seriousness of this. This is slow but massive, hard to stop once you set it in motion. And why would you want to lose the coast and change them? I mean, imagine if somebody tried to take them from you. Why would we, you know, just because it's slow, not be upset that we're letting the ocean take it from us? Uh, but just be aware, it's not this, if you saw that crazy movie. It's not like you go down to Wrightsville Beach, you go to, you know, with your kids, you put the towel on there, you go to the snack bar to get an ice cream, and you come back and the kids are washed away. <laughs> so it's huge, but it's slow. It's massive. It's a giant super tanker coming at us. So, so it's important to get that. Not, there's no need to exaggerate the drama. It's really dramatic on its own, and stick into the science of it. So the main difference is, um, between these two scenarios is if we do the moderate one, there's a fairly good chance that it will be moderate and somewhat reversible over not too long a time, uh, but there is some kind of tipping point process that we, we're going to cross, and we, we don't all agree where it is, how much farther, but at some point, if we warm the earth enough, other processes kick in. The rising in the sea level, the warming of the seas, the, the thawing of permafrost, all these other things pile on and you get this positive feedback loop where it rolls out of control <clears throat> in addition to what we would do and that would be what happened in that extreme event. So we're, we're heading into unknown territory as to how far we can push this before we get the extreme event as well. So. Um, we're, we're about at the lowest emotional point of the talk, by the way. <laughs> we'll wallow a little farther in here, but uh, it's sometimes tempting when you look at the past and you say, well, we've had warm things in the past before. Species just moved around. You know, well, what's the big deal? We've had warm Well, like, that would be a mistake. First of all, just because it happened in the past doesn't mean you want to go through it again. The other thing is, it's different now. We're in this new time period which I should have explained when I first showed you that list of environmental uh, woes we're facing. There's a new term for our time in geologic history now, modeled on the geologic time scale, where you know you have the age of dinosaurs, the age of fishes, things like that. You have these epochs of geologic time, the Pleistocene epoch, the Holocene, Eocene, all these things. The new term that's coming up from the scientific community, which a lot of you have heard of now and are familiar with, I think it's a great term. It's the age of humans, the Anthropocene epoch. This is different because we're in the picture and we're so numerous, our technology is so powerful and we're so interconnected. We have become a geologic force of nature on par with ice ages. And it's deserving of a geologic name. Now, because we've had these things in the past, does not mean those analogies are perfect models of the future because we, this is now the Anthropocene 
and we are in the picture. So, for example, uh, things often did fine because they could migrate. That's hard because we're in the way. Our roads, our farms, <coughs> our cities. Um, the adaptive strategy was to move as the climate conditions move. And if sea level or climate are changing at a suitable pace, coral reefs, marshes, whatever they were, could sort of keep pace. And as the sea level's going up, they grow higher or move inland. And then when it's dropping, they go the other way. But uh, that's hard when there's nowhere to go. So um, that's one of the situations we face with the sea level stuff. So uh, where can some of these ecosystems go? Just a single meter of sea level rise, likely within a century, the lifetime even of some of the people in the room here maybe, um, that's where the Everglades are now. There's not really a lot of place for them to move to. There's uh, the other side of the coin of those nice oceans taking up all that CO2 for us. Isn't that nice they're cleaning the air? Well, of course, when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, it makes a weak acid, carbonic acid. And that upsets the chemical balance of the oceans. And it makes it harder for a lot of marine life to make their shells and things like that. And uh, folks in the room here are looking into that. What are the effects? How can they handle it? What's going to suffer? What's not? But uh, we do know there are examples from the past of uh, pretty serious consequences of this. When we had that PETM extreme warming 56 million years ago, you can still see the signs of it in the ocean sediments around the world. This is a picture of an ocean sediment core, I think it's the South Atlantic, um, where the sediment was kind of creamy colored from all of the chalky shells from the plankton that had fallen to the bottom. Then you see this sudden break. Time is going this way. It's creamy, creamy. It's like, boom. It's not creamy anymore. It's rusty. This is because all of the limey shells dissolved on the bottom of the ocean. It corroded the bottom of the sea, and it took tens of thousands of years to recover. That's the acidification from that giant natural greenhouse. So concerns about ocean acidification in the deep sea are not unfounded. So, okay, that's the lowest, lowest, lowest. Okay, now, it's important to continue once you dip your toe in this pool here. I'm convinced people are going to live through this. Not everybody is. I'm sure if we did a survey of the room here, some of you think humans won't be around on these time scales. Uh, make a list of what can really take us all out. You know, but more people live. You know, and I'm not saying it won't be hard times. I'm, I'm convinced when I say that people are going to live through this, it's not a cop out. It's actually a, a, a statement of responsibility, because it means people are going to live through this. What we're setting in motion. There's an ethical dimension because we're causing it. I'll, I'll wager that there are going to be parts of the planet that will be easier to live in. If I were going to invest, I'd invest in Greenland. It's already changing in ways that are, I would think, mostly positive for Greenlanders. Longer growing seasons, you get fresh vegetables now, when before they were only available at great cost uh, from Denmark. So maybe more people will have more nutritious diets. There, uh, the Danes have been doing geological surveys, finding precious gems and metals in the rocks under here. Here's what it's like if it de-ices, which it might eventually do. There's a giant fjord in the middle with access to the shipping lanes in the North Atlantic, which of course will be ice-free. There'll be trade routes going over the poles. They got all kinds of resources there. So the point here is not always this wonderful the Greenlander just so happy and let's forget everybody else. The point is people are going to live through these. There will be places, people experiencing these things. We can't cop out by saying the world's going to come to an end. And this is something we are affecting people thousands of years in the future. You can see the stuff happening. It's not all bad, not all good. It's a mix. Uh, but the winners now may be the losers later. Uh, here's just some examples from the far north. Uh, a lot of common sense things. When one species loses, like the polar bears and the harp seals, which need the ice, uh, others are moving in. Harbor seals are moving in. They don't need as much ice. Polar bears are moving up. You may have heard that they're hybridizing with uh, grizzlies and polar bears are hybridizing. Um, they're trying to come up with what do you call a hybrid, a pizzly, <laughs> or a polar grizz, or something like that, uh, whatever. Um, but that makes sense. You know, they're closely related. They're mingling now. The polar bears are getting more trapped on shore. You have the uh, ice-adapted uh, cetaceans up there, the whales and stuff, without the, the high dorsal fins, the belugas and narwhals. As the ice goes away, orcas are moving in. 
and it's okay uh, with their big fins there. They, they got more open water, and they can handle it, and they love to eat belugas. So, you know, there are winners and losers in all these things. Uh, you may have heard about the land grab going on up there in the north. That's some entertaining stuff. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the contest between Denmark and Canada about this little island between Greenland and Canada. It's called Hans Island. It's like a square mile nub the rock. Nobody cared about it. And no one had decided whose territory it was in. But it didn't matter until the ice started going away. And the trade routes started opening up and things like that. Then they decided, my gosh, you've got the ocean rights around this too. So it almost turned into a war. Uh, the Danes went in there, they set up a flag, they put a bottle of snop there in the bottom of the flagpole. <laughs> Little sign says, Welcome to the Danish Island. <laughs> and when the Canadians heard it, it's Stephen Harper, no problem. Oh, we gotta defend our territory. And they flew in and they knocked down the flagpole and they drank the snops. And I don't know if they put up Molson's or whatever there. <laughs> Until eventually it was worked out. Unfortunately, the dividing line does go right through the island. But it didn't matter, now it matters. <coughs> have you, have you, you heard that Russia claimed the North Pole, right? It's submersible on the bottom. I mean, if you don't think this is happening, you tell people who don't believe this is happening, why are people almost fighting over it up there? You know, there's money involved and uh, international relations. So to start to bring this around now, um, there are just some facts here. It's a mix of good and bad. There's the good news. I think the, the human race will survive, whether you like the human race or not. I hope you do. <laughs> the bad news is many species may not. And of course, there'd be all kinds of problems for people that have to live through this. The reality is we're choosing the future, either by acting or by doing nothing. There's no way out of it because we're in the Anthropocene now and we're affecting the world in a geologic way, either on purpose or by accident. And that's our choice. Be aware of ourselves or not. I feel like even if we are not the ones who come up with a single push button solution, it's important to set a tone on an Anthropocene planet, kind of like a, a healthful broth instead of a polluted, negative, panic, hateful atmosphere, where people who do maybe have the potential to get the answers are empowered and motivated to make them. And then we support them. And I think part of that is understanding our place in history, to realize that we are part of this globally linked Anthropocene. Especially the young folks. I feel like they're almost a new species of human for the first time on Earth to be this globally connected. And the, the young folks I deal with are on this. They're idealistic and smart and empowered. And they're polite. That's why you don't hear about them in the news. I don't think people see them coming. It's great. They got a few years till the bad guys figure out they're here. So if any of you are in this room, act fast. The choices are going to be made in the next few decades. We are living through them right now. We're playing this role. Our lives are very important. And to get back to that, I think it's a great phrase. Now more than ever, it's important to learn what is true so we can do what is right. And science is our clearest window on the truth. People like Larry, people like this center here, the people like those kids that will come with your programs with this center here. It's really, really important stuff going on now. The other side of this is to learn what is true so you can do what is right. And I feel like the missing ingredient in this story has been the organizations that have the vocabulary and the authority and the credibility to make ethical decisions as well instead of the science. And that's the faith community. And uh, I, hope, I hope you've been hearing what's been going on in the faith community in recent years. It's incredibly uplifting after years of resistance denominations and faiths all over the world are starting to see that the creation is our responsibility and respect for the creation is respect for the creator and that we have a mandate to do this. You've been following the Pope's right. stuff with the new um, encyclical that's coming out next month. He's basically going to say pollution is a sin. This is going to enlist huge forces for good to have this alive. He calls scientists precious allies. <laughs> It's amazing. The world is changing. Um, so it's happening. Watch for it. Support it if you can. Um, there are, you know, possible technical solutions out there. I'm, it's not my expertise, you know, but China and India are going gangbusters on solar and wind while we're arguing whether, you know, the world's warming or not. They're making they're make a lot of money. But don't forget, this is the Anthropocene. Who cares who figures this out? 
if they figure it out, fine. We can copy them or buy this stuff. It's, it's fantastic. Um, I'll leave you with one homework assignment. Um, have you heard of Green News? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. This is, what, this is interesting. I, I, I was an anti-nuke protester in college. <laughs> They're so bad. And, well, then I heard someone start talking about this stuff. And I want you to look this up and tell me if there's anything to it. Um, these things, instead of running on plutonium and uranium, they run on thorium. It's supposed to be less long life, less dangerous. Um, you're, it's supposed to be cheaper and more abundant. You can make them smaller, small enough to fit on a truck or a submarine and anchor them offshore and unhook them when a tsunami comes or something like that. Uh, they can't melt down because they're finicky. If anything goes wrong, they just automatically stop. You can make huge, you can, you can burn up nuclear waste from the standard nuclear power plants and destroy the more uh, nasty waste. And you can't make explosive weapons out of them, which maybe is why we're not using them. <laughs> so anyway, so when I hear this from folks, I say, oh my gosh, you know, you have this unlimited, you could make so much electricity, you could split water and have a hydrogen economy too. It's amazing. All right, so this would be great. So then I, I want to ask these people, what is the dark side that's going to be uh, catching? So there is no. Right. <laughs> Your assignment is find the dark side. <laughs> if there is none, we got to do this and support it. If there is one, we got to know because there's a big push to make this happen. Um, that might be a great technological thing. So there is some technical hope too, but my big hope is the people out here, and I know the world's a tough place, uh, some of it's magnified by the media, they're just selling stories to get your attention and repeating the most horrible ones. There's a push now, have you heard of the Huffington Post, wanting to have a whole push now to talk about what's working for change in the stories as well, without just being starry-eyed, because it's, it's a harmful illusion that the world is all, that it's time to give up. It's not, now it's time to get busy. And, uh, you know, not everybody's on board, but I am working with kids, uh, you know, in their 20s and teens that are totally into this. In fact, let me, let me do a survey right here. we got people at different age, right? How many of you in this room are mostly depressed by what you heard tonight? <laughs> How many of you are psyched and like this is a challenge that we can meet? Okay. A lot of people are feeling this, especially the younger folks. Because it is, and I hear the language of saying, um, you know, my grandfolks, whatever, uh, they were the greatest generation World War II was their challenge. This is our challenge, and we got this. It's really great. So we have things like um, that People's Climate March, which was mostly ignored by the media, and only more than 100,000 people showed up. It's not going to change the world, but it's showing the world is changing. It was amazing to be there. Some of you might have been there. I see all these folks from all over. They are out there. There's this cohort of people. Um, and even if you don't come up with solutions, support them with your votes. You can support them with your money. You can support them with your words, your lifestyle. Anybody in education, anybody in outreach, anybody with a family. This is incredibly important work to set this tone so that we can do this. And I really feel like we can. So with that, I'll welcome you to the Anthropocene. And uh, open up for questions and comments. Thank you for coming. I read recently a, a science paper and they said that they discovered some granules. I don't know if they were made of, but they said they absorb oxygen. So instead of school diving, I decided to have a couple of tanks in the back and have a handful of these grains to be able to rebreathe. I haven't heard of breathable oxygen grains for the deep sea. Have you heard anything or anybody? We yeah, haven't heard of it. Okay. <laughs> And 
And I think it's important because a lot of folks say, well, wind won't solve all our problems. Solar won't solve. Well, of course it won't. But it's part of the solution. You don't have to have everybody do the same thing. You do what works where you live, and that reduces the demand for this other stuff. And once you make the markets for it, that also helps. I think that will be at the Coastline Convention Center tomorrow at 5 p.m. Uh, yes, the morning is going to be oil drilling downtown, and the blockade runner is the end. Washington Road is on the 17th. Because you want to be talking about the wind. Somebody that there may be somebody who's well versed in this. I can wing it. Anybody know a lot about it? I don't know a lot about it, but I'll tell you that in other countries like France, something like 40% of their power comes from nuclear power plants. Yeah. Yeah. I think the short answer is the fusion just doesn't work yet. It's very energy intensive, and people are working on it, but not as intensely as others. But there are additional nuclear energy also that's not just fusion. Right. So, so your uh, climate whiplash graph, uh, you had the moderate graph where, uh, so is that moderate, you know, if we're going along at the same energy replacement rate where we're adding solar, we're increasing the dependency on solar and wind, and we're still using fossil fuels, or is that and fossil fuels right today, and that will be what it's going to be. Yeah. Or is there a smaller one that's just like, is that one? Well, there's a whole sequence of possibilities. I understand that, yeah. So this is just a broad brush sort of a big picture thing. So obviously, if, uh, if we stop now, there's still stuff in the air, and we'll still yeah. warm. The sooner you stop, the lower the peak is. So with that moderate one, is that, you know, given our current rate of uh, Getting, uh, I don't know, dieting on um, is that the moderate one? Or? No, what we're on now is the extreme one. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay, so moderate one. That's business as usual. Gotcha. That's where we're headed. Yeah. What was the, uh, the, the time frame for the uh, maximum peak? Yeah, I now, very, very I'm going to flip through because that's important, the time frame. That when you crunch it onto a graph, it looks like a pinprick. Exactly. It's huge. It's that like spike yeah. is huge. And I may have a chart of it, so I'm going to flip through some spare slides in here. Ah, there it is. <laughs> this is, how do I back up? Yeah, here's a close up of that spike. Look at the time frame. This is 2080. This is the next 2,000 years. This is sort of spanning some of the peak. I mean, when you spread it out, it's actually long on a human time frame. And uh, the whiplash thing is actually not just boom, boom. It's like staggered whiplash. It's wave after wave of change. You got here, starting now, you, you, you burn everything, and then you can't burn anymore. And so the emissions drop off to nothing. The CO2, the temperature, and the sea level is all going up. Sea level, I mean, I'm sorry, the, uh, the CO2 will go here and then peter out because we stopped emitting. So that, that will come later. 
like 100 years later. CO2 will keep going up. And then it's, here's the long drop off going and going and going thousands into the future. Then uh, the temperature, of course, is still going up, catching up after this. This is the thermal peak going and going and going on the human scale. This is like Roman Empire, ancient Egypt time scales and longer. And even after this goes off, the sea level is just going to keep going. We're going to have global cooling with sea level rise because it will be so hot. Even as the temperature is falling, the ice will keep melting. And so it's going to be this unbelievable mix of mishmash for adapting to stuff that we're setting in motion. It's not just this little window right here that we're focusing on. And it's not over in a century. It's huge. It's, it's the ethical imperative we have to recognize what we're doing. And then not panic, but realize we've done this unintentionally. Think of what we can do on purpose. Um, we'll do one more and then I'll wrap up and I'll hang out as long as you like. I wish I could show you the name of the program or if it was a news release and where the meeting was, but NPR was, had a brief mention of a meeting on global warming and one theory was to put moon out and reflect sunlight back. Yeah, the, the geoengineering thing is maybe entertaining to think of, but it, it really misses the complexity of real ecosystems. It doesn't get rid of the CO2. So it doesn't stop ocean acidification, for example, and uh, just all the logistics of the mirrors and things. It's really not practical, in my opinion, and a lot of other folks. I'll stay around, and thank you so much for coming. And uh, tell everybody to...